Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the San Carlos City Council Successor Agency, uh, to the Redevelopment Agency meeting of April 13th, 2015. Would you all please rise and join me in the Pledge of Allegiance? Okay, do we have any changes to the order of the agenda? No changes from staff this evening, Mr. Mayor. All right. Um, is there a report from closed session? No, Mr. Mayor, no reportable items from closed session tonight. Okay, um, why don't we start with uh, Mark on council communications and announcements. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. A few items to talk about. Uh, I attended on behalf of the council as our representative the a, a, uh, South Bayside Waste Management Authority board meeting uh, since our last meeting. Uh, the uh, agency is beginning to take up its process of establishing a long-range plan governing its activities for the next five or six years, which will also include the period when we have to renegotiate the current recology contract. So if anybody has interest in that, um, uh, please feel free to get in touch with me and, and I can give you more details about it. Um, last Friday evening, um, uh, my wife and I, along with... Uh, 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 Matt went to a, a very touching and moving uh, traveling Vietnam War Memorial up in uh, Golden Gate National Cemetery uh, where all of the uh, soldiers uh, who died in the Vietnam War who were residents of San Mateo County were honored. Uh, it, was a, it was a very uh, poignant experience, and I'll let Matt talk more about it um, uh, when the mic goes over to him, but I uh, appreciated the opportunity to be there. Um, the um, had an opportunity also to attend the Kiwana Show, the biannual Kiwana Show at Central Middle School this past Saturday, which was uh, Bright Lights of Broadway. It was a beautiful experience, a lot of fun. I strongly encourage anybody who likes watching uh, music and dancing and singing and whatnot, uh, uh, take it up. It's going to be there this weekend as well. And you'll even get to see uh, uh, the uh, wife of the mayor sing. I had no idea that Gail was such a good, a good singer. So um, didn't see Ron up there, though, yet. So. Um, and then uh, two other things. One is, uh, I apologize for missing our last meeting due to, due to illness, but um, I know line 147 was discussed. Uh, we have hopefully going, to, we are hopefully going to shortly be having the uh, official uh, robotic sensing uh, process uh, uh, for checking out that line get underway finally. Um, I'm very concerned that uh, we actually have a representative of the city on site when that uh, data collection is being done. I know the robot actually sort of stores the data internally or so I've been told, but I really think we ought to have somebody there. Um, and to be uh, perfectly frank, uh, a lot of my motivation for that is uh, we need to remember PG&E is an organization that's currently under investigation by the federal government for uh, potentially uh, uh, monkeying around with their reporting requirements and their data collection. So I think better safe than sorry. So I hope that's something we'll be able to do. And finally, um, this council was, I think, uh, uh, ahead of the curve, at least a little bit, in taking action to try and uh, do some local activity to deal with California's drought situation. Uh, we were superseded by the governor, who imposed some more drastic things. But um, I actually would like to see if uh, any of my colleagues are interested in having uh, staff and Cal Water come back and lead us in a discussion in uh, uh, perhaps some additional steps that we ought to be taking. I won't go into what I think those should be because I want to see if there's interest in, in doing it. But I'd like to see that on the agenda in the near future. All right. uh, any other interest in that? Well, I believe we have an uh, agenda item coming back on enforcement. Is that right, Jeff? No, I, th I think uh, the ordinance is in effect, or the ordinance is done. It goes into effect. May 15th. Well, I guess, wasn't there a question about funding for enforcement, or did we already appropriate the... We appropriated what we think is enough, and then the council le uh, graciously left the door open to us in case we needed more uh, once we got into the experience. I mean, I, I guess I would be interested to hear more once we kind of start the... Once the ordinance goes into effect and once we start the enforcement cycle to see how it's going. Is that what you're talking about, Mark? Uh, no, because actually I'm, I'm not actually looking at, at what we've done already. I think there are some additional things that, given what the governor has done, that, that uh, 
uh, I wouldn't mind us discussing. I mean, just mention one in particular, um, you know, uh, whether or not we want to think about um, allocating some funds to create some kind of grant program to encourage people to replace lawns with, with less water intensive ground covering. That's something I don't think we've ever really talked about before. Um, and there are a number of other things to talk about too, but that's really where, more where I'm heading. I see. Yeah, I mean, I would be open to talking about it. I think it's an important topic that's on a lot of people's minds. So, Okay. Uh, any other votes for that? Well, I, I would, I'll, I'll join Cameron and Mark, and so would love, love to get another update. That's all I have, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Uh, Matt? Thank you. Uh, as Mark said, the uh, memorial for the... Uh, Vietnam veterans, or the the, the um, men who died uh, fighting the Vietnam War, was up in San Bruno at the Golden Gate Cemetery. Uh, they have a, this model, if you will, of the wall that is in Washington D.C. and it moves around the country. And it was here, and I went and uh, was asked to read the names of those who had died, who were from San Carlos. Uh, there were eight. Uh, young men who died during that war who were from San Carlos, two of whom were brothers, uh, the, the Merrill brothers. And uh, as Mark said, it was, uh, it was very poignant, and it made me think, as a, now a father, what it would be like to send your, your son or daughter off to war and, uh, and then have that instance where they don't come back. Uh, war is a very ugly thing, and of course, it should always be used if it's used at all at the as a last resort. So um, it spoke to me very deeply, and I think it spoke very deeply to the uh, Vietnam veterans who were there as well. So they were, I could tell, they were very um, pleased, if you will, that there were so many. There were about 250 people in attendance, and uh, they were very touched by those who were there. Okay. Thanks, Matt. Um, Bob. Um, <clears throat> I had, um, I guess, a meeting of the Silicon Valley Clean Water Board, uh, which is, of course, uh, representatives from Belmont, San Carlos, Redwood City, and uh, West Bay, which basically is Atherton and Menlo Park. Um, we meet monthly. Um, the major item that we were talking about, of course, in the, in the rebuilding of the plant and the improving, bringing it up to the 21st century, uh, there's a huge pipe that has to go through um, Redwood Shore somewhere. And uh, so the representative from Redwood City is really directly affected more than, than the rest of us, but we're all paying for it. So we have to figure out the best way. It's going to, I think, next month come back to us uh, uh, as uh, some different choices of cost versus uh, benefit, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Staff's been working on a number of different variables try to make this um, come out properly. Uh, I'm trying to think of what other commissions. I've got a commute.org this week, but I think I think that's all I had, Mr. Mayor. Okay, thanks. And Cameron. Excuse me. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, a bunch of things, um, which I'll touch on briefly. Uh, there was a meeting of the Economic Development Subcommittee, which is Ron and I, and we talked about um, Business Improvement District um, and talked to our consultant and uh, got that process kicked off, so that's exciting. Um, I attended a Council of Cities dinner in South San Francisco, which is a meeting of city council members and mayors from uh, San Mateo County. The, the topic of discussion is a big topic on a lot of people's minds, which is um, housing and um, what, um, what cities can be doing to support um, the construction of new housing. There was a presentation from California Apartment Association and a presentation from a representative from uh, San Mateo County Realtors. So it was a good discussion. Um, I, uh, I also serve on the um, San Mateo County Mental Health and Substance Abuse Recovery Commission. Um, there was an interesting item from the last meeting that I attended. Um, there is, uh, San Mateo County now has a one officer, um, excuse me, the, the San Mateo County Sheriff's Office now has one officer who's specifically trained as kind of a crisis intervention um, clinician. So um, unfortunately, there are cases when um, people who have mental illness have crises. Um, often the cops are called, and sometimes officers um, who don't necessarily have uh, training in dealing with people who are having crises um, can get into um, violent altercations. 
there was a, a tragedy last year where um, a woman in Half Moon Bay, uh, who's 18 years old, uh, was having a, a crisis, and she was unfortunately um, shot and killed by by the officer who arrived on scene. Um, so the county's been investing in trying to get um, people who have specific training um, deployed in the field, and um, the, there is a full-time officer now who is a trained clinician, and, and the reason I bring it up is because he's going to be based out of the San Carlos um, Police uh, Station. So I thought that was an interesting thing to note and a, a step in the right direction. Um, Mark and I attended a meeting this morning with um, San Carlos Green to talk about um, the upcoming revision of our climate action plan that's coming up at our next council meeting. So I thought it was a good discussion about what specific steps we can take in, in the next few years um, to continue to reduce greenhouse gas emissions in, in San Carlos. Um, we got a good, uh, there, were, there was some good information shared about all the progress that we've already made. Um, and so that was, that was very uh, good to see. And we're just talking about the next steps. Um, and I think the last thing I would say tonight is, um, as many people are aware, there's an um, election in San Carlos this month um, for Measure P, which is a, a um, parcel tax to support um, education. It's a, it's a renewal uh, and an increase in, a, in an existing parcel tax. Um, and uh, it's something that um, I'm very supportive of um, and I think is even if you don't have kids in the school district, it's something that supports um, a, a lot of great benefits to the city. Um, and I think um, we on the city council have been working you know, very closely with um, the school district on a shared mission of creating a, a great place to, to live, work, and play. And so um, I encourage people to read all the information and, and consider supporting Measure P. That's all I got. Great. Thanks, Cameron. Um, I just have a few things. Uh, I. I'm a member of the Housing Endowment and Regional Trust, and we had a meeting uh, last month, and the focus of that meeting was talking about um, the progress we're trying to make, or we are making, on having a consultant advise us on how we can uh, raise more uh, funds uh, regionally to uh, uh, build affordable housing. With the demise of the of, of RDA, it is incumbent on virtually every city in the county and probably the state actually to find new creative ways to come up with uh, the, the funds that are necessary for affordable housing. The good news is, is in San Carlos, we are uh, making some good progress toward that end. But it's going to take, uh, um, I think, a larger regional effort and a collaborative effort between all the housing agencies in San Mateo County to really make a difference in the future. Um, I also, uh, I wouldn't normally talk about this, but I went to a, an open house that was given by... Uh, um, Kevin Mullen and Jerry Hill are our representatives in Sacramento. The reason that I went was not just to have a meet and greet because I, you know, in this position we, we get to call them whenever we want. But the main reason I, I wanted to go was to find out you know, what they could tell us directly is uh, the current thought process in Sacramento with respect to the drought. Now we all know that the governor's taken action and we've taken action here in San Carlos, but uh, I a couple people asked a question about it, and one of the things that uh, Kevin Mullen said was that there are people who are uh, eating and sleeping uh, the drought and in Sacramento that are thinking about it every day. And I think every day, and I think what you're going to see out of that, and I think you're beginning to see it already, is some more action by the state, not just uh, cutbacks of 25%. You're going to start seeing some more ideas that the state is going to promote or take themselves to either develop more water resources or or conserve water. So I'm very hopeful that that process will take place, and that's the main reason that I went. Um, one of the things uh, is a tradition I believe was started by Mark. I continued it um, as a monthly visit to the Elms, which has been uh, a uh, turned out to has turned out to be a very pleasant experience. Uh, I go over there uh, once a month and give the residents of the Elms an update on what we've been talking about at the council. And it's kind of nice to see uh, that these people are very interested in what's going on. A lot of things that, you know, they can't, they can't watch. Some of them don't have TV. Some of them just don't care to watch our meetings on TV. They want a sort of a live update. And it's also interesting to see that some of these residents are parents of, of friends of mine that are there now. So that, that's kind of nice. It's a, obviously a beautiful uh, facility and, and well run. Um, then I'm also a member of the Four Corners Working Group, which is a group of uh, representatives from San Carlos, Belmont, 
Sequoia Union High School District and San Carlos Elementary School District to find ways to solve the traffic problem issues surrounding Carlmont High School in Terra Linda, where San Carlos Avenue becomes uh, Alameda de las Pulgas. And many people probably, if you've, if you've uh, driven it during school hours and during the morning or the afternoon when it's impacted the most, uh, have realized uh, what a mess it is, and it's just gotten worse over the years. Um, so we've been working very hard. We've had a traffic engineer working on various proposals. We've already had one public meeting in March, and there is going to be another public meeting. It will be on Thursday, I believe it's Thursday, the 29th of April, or is that Wednesday? I'm not sure. It's either Wednesday the 29th or Thursday the 30th. Um, I have posted something on it, and it will be, I believe it will be on our uh, city website. But it will be a public open house. It will be from 6.30 to 8.30 at Tierra Linda School. Public is invited. We'd love to hear your ideas. There will be th uh, three alternatives that are being discussed on how to mitigate the traffic in that area. And none of those alternatives have been decided on yet. So we are welcoming public input. And whatever happens, we hope will be a very good long-term solution to the, to, the, uh, to the problems that are uh, in that area. And then finally, uh, as Mark alluded to, I, I did have the opportunity to work at the Kiwana show. It was nice to work at that show rather than in that show, which I did for a number of years. It's nice not to have to wear makeup or memorize lines or dance on stage. Uh, anyway, it was a great experience, and the Kiwana Show, uh, is, it's an institution. It's been going on since the early 50s, and all they do is they just they raise money to support uh, activities uh, and, in San Carlos and give back to the community. So it was, it was kind of nice to go back and see old friends. Okay, I think that's all I have, and next would be if there are any staff comments or city administrative business. Yeah, I've got a few uh, this evening for you, uh, Mr. Mayor, going back to the drought. Um, as has been discussed thoroughly, the governor has de declared a drought emergency with 25% uh, water restrictions. Uh, previously, uh, the city had imposed 20% restrictions uh, on itself and was in the process of promulgating that ordinance out to the public. Our ordinance doesn't interfere with the the governor's uh, order, which goes beyond what, what we had. So the city will be working um, with our public work staff to identify ways to cut our water usage by an additional 5%. And, of course, we uh, one of the specific uh, issues addressed by the governor was that we would no longer be able to use potable water for any median landscaping. So we've got a few issues that we need to work out as a result of the governor's order so we'll uh, continue to do that and report back to the council perhaps part of this uh, new item that was suggested tonight uh, by council uh, also i want to make the public aware that uh, at the mayor's request uh, the city has signed up for the uh, mayor's national water conservation challenge for the month of april uh, we did this uh, last year uh, the city finished fourth so uh, basically if uh, Folks in the community want to participate, you go uh, online to the mywaterpledge.com uh, website and uh, sign up to take part and represent uh, the city of San Carlos. And basically it's just a checklist that you go through as a resident to commit to doing certain uh, things to conserve water and energy uh, in the month of April. Uh, we're in the process of uh, doing quite a bit of community outreach on uh, the potential uh, Black Mountain uh, Properties bond measure for a park and open space. Uh, we're going to be meeting with uh, a whole number of uh, community groups and organizations over the coming weeks. And uh, on, is it uh, April 25th? And, yeah, April 25th uh, from 10 a.m. to 12 p.m., uh, the city will be hosting an open house uh, at the Black Mountain Properties. Uh, so if you'd like uh, more information, there's quite a bit on the city's website. So please take a look, and we'll be mailing uh, and have been mailing. Uh, uh, in fact, we think we mailed over 14,000 uh, postcards out uh, to the community uh, about that. Uh, finally, uh, also on uh, Saturday, this coming Saturday, April 25th, uh, from 9.30 a.m. to 12.30 p.m., 
the city will be hosting a uh, volunteer expo at the uh, San, San Carlos Adult Community Center. That's what I've got. All right. Thanks. And uh, I did look it up. The, the uh, uh, open house for the Four Corners project is on Thursday, April 30th, starting at 630. Okay. Um, I think we are now at... Oh, presentations. All right. Um, we've got three presentations tonight, uh, proclamations. The first is to two of our residents who I see here, and I'd like them to come up. And I want to uh, present them with a, uh, proclamations, and we'll go on to the other two. Not often that you get an, uh, the honor to do things for people that you know and like. And uh, I was thinking about this over the weekend, and I just I, I put together a, just something that I'd like to say. I don't normally I just sort of sort of wing it sometimes, but I think this is important at this point that uh, I wrote down what I wanted to say. So just bear with me a moment. Um, I wanted to say how lucky we are in this town to have longtime residents like Tom Davids and Mark Hazeloup, who have served San Carlos in many capacities over the years for little or no compensation other than the gratitude of its residents. Between them, these two men have served on the Planning Commission, City Council, San Carlos Development Corporation Board of Directors, and which oversees the operations of the Elms, which is our premier senior residence facility. To me, Tom and Mark represent what we're all about, a town whose character is defined by the service of people who care deeply about making San Carlos a better place. They've always found time in their busy schedules to contribute their time, real world experience and ideas to whatever group they've been part of. And these proclamations are presented tonight as a token of the city's appreciation of your service as members of the San Carlos Development Corporation but I want to personally thank both of you for your friendship, your leadership, and your advice over the years. Thank you both. If I had four hands, I could hold up my hand. But just to, uh, so that people know what they say, uh, Basically, they say, whereas the San Carlos Development Corporation, a nonprofit public entity with a charitable purpose to own, maintain, and operate a residential care facility in the city of San Carlos was established in September of 1992, and whereas Tom Davids and Mark Caseloop, because they're both of them, <laughs> have served on the board uh, since 1993 for Mark and 1995 uh, for Tom. We've been very fortunate to have two people who have been stewards of this fine organization for so long and have uh, contributed so much to it. Um, and there's also another line here in here, whereas Mark Hazeloop assisted the board in developing the Grove, which is a second wing, which had opened in 2004, to provide specialized memory care dedicated to those living with dementia. Um, and also throughout the years uh, as with uh, of experience as a city council member and mayor and his vast knowledge and experience as a real estate professional, Tom Davids has provided insight to the board on community goals and values. So I, again, I want to thank both of these gentlemen. They are treasures to the community, and we are really, as I mentioned before, lucky to have them as participants in our community. Thank you both. Okay, and we have uh, two others. Um, do we have someone here? Yes, we do. Uh, I, uh, this is a proclamation declaring the April 19th through the 25th, uh, West Nile Virus and Med Mosquito and Vector Control Awareness Week, and Betsy Schneider is here. Hello, Betsy. I wanted to thank you. 
Um, Betsy has been on the board of directors for the mosquito. Uh, we call it mosquito abatement board, but it's, it's really now mosquito and vector control. It's now mosquito and vector control. Um, and we want to thank you for all the work that you've done. And we wanted to recognize that the uh, uh, West Nile virus week is uh, coming up next week, right? <coughs> all right. Well, did you want to say anything? I just I just wanted to let you know that the uh, Mosquito and Vector Control District is now in excellent health, finally. Um, we have hired a new manager who has a PhD in parapsychology. Um, parasitology. <laughs> yeah. Parapsychology. <laughs> Parasites. <laughs> And um, she was a former director at Alameda County, and before that, she was a Mosquito and Vector Controls Lab Director, and we're delighted to have her. We've also hired a full-time public relations and outreach officer by the name of Megan Caldwell, and she has totally revamped our website, made it user-friendly, and we are now in compliance with all of the recommendations from the grand jury. Thank you for your support. Thank you, Betsy. <laughs> and the final proclamation we have is recognizing tomorrow, April 14th, as Equal Pay Day. Do we have a representative here? Come on up. And you are? Betty Torres. Betty Torres. Um, tomorrow is Equal Pay Day, and whereas more than 50 years after the passage of the Equal Pay Act, women, especially minority women, continue to suffer the consequences of unequal pay. And according to the U.S. Census Bureau, women working full-time year-round in 2013 typically earned 78% of what men earned, indicating little change or progress. And according to the graduating to graduating to a pay gap, the 2012 research report by the American Association of University Women, the gender pay gap is evident one year after college graduation, even after controlling for factors known as effect earnings, such as occupations, uh, occupation hours worked, and, and college major, and nearly four in ten mothers are primary breadwinners in their household, and nearly two-thirds are primary or significant earners making equal making pay equity critical to families' economic security. I think anybody in this room who is male and married uh, would agree that this is, uh, and I, I guess I should say also if, even if you're not married, um, it's, it's just essential. I find it kind of shameful that uh, in this day and age that we have not reached uh, pay equity. Uh, would you like to say something, Betty? We appreciate your acknowledgement that we do need equal pay, and I'm accepting this on behalf of the San Carlos branch of the American Association of University Women. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, moving on to public comment. Uh, persons wishing to address the City Council on matters not on the posted agenda may do so. Each speaker is limited to two minutes. If an item you are speaking on is not listed on the agenda, please be advised the City Council may briefly respond to statements made or questions posed as allowed under the Brown Act. The City Council's general policy is to refer items to staff for attention or have the matter placed on a future City Council agenda for a more comprehensive action or report and formal public discussion and input at that time. And I see that we have three speakers for public comment. The first would be Paul Maginetti. Thank you. I have two things. I'll try to be brief. Um, the first is the situation on Holly Street. Now that you've won something, I can't imagine what it is you've won. There's a dangerous situation that you have 
an opportunity to demonstrate your goodwill and redeem yourself to the community. And actually, two have been suggested one by one of your own. One is to limit the speed limit, and the other is to get the diesel semi trucks off of Holly and onto industrial. And I would add, have lights at each end telling the drivers when those lanes are open and when those lanes are closed. They are, they are the ones who are hitting the cars and causing the unsafe conditions, which we know are unsafe because every time the first responders come out, they are grumbling about it. Um, the other is on the Black Mountain space. Um, if it's just going to be another open space, we have a whole mid-peninsula open space reserve. I don't see that that's worth my money to spend it on unless you actually use that resource. It's a spring. You could build an underground cistern as big as you want. You could even have a little up over above the ground so you could have a rock climbing wall. Let the spring fill it up. In an emergency, make it earthquake proof, in an emergency, then you will have that water that you could truck out for people who might need it. I would vote for something like that, but another trail and some picnic tables is just not something I'm interested in. Thank you very much. Thank you, Paul. All right, next we have Bill Chang. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, good evening, Mr. Mayor, Council Members, uh, City Staff. Uh, I'm Bill Chang, your local government relations rep from uh, PG&E. Uh, here to tell you about the um, San Carlos step up and power down uh, activities that uh, have already started this week at the uh, at the youth center, and it's uh, focused on. Uh, excuse me, San Carlos Step Up and Power Down is, uh, is, a, is an effort to, focused on uh, helping the uh, families and the residents of uh, San Carlos be uh, wiser in their energy use at home and to help them uh, save, uh, save money and to save energy at the same time. Uh, the, uh, the activities at the Youth Center, of course, are focused on youth to help them uh, um, perhaps influence their parents at home to, uh, to be uh, wiser about their energy use. And uh, here with me is, uh, is uh, Aaron Malcolm Brandt with... Uh, San Carlos Step Up and Power Down to uh, give you a few more details. Okay. Welcome, Erin. Great. Thank you. Um, so as Bill said, my name is Erin. I'm with um, a local initiative that's a partnership between the city of San Carlos and um, PG&E called San Carlos Step Up and Power Down. And we're a team. Um, it's myself and four local organizers who are working here in the community to connect residents to energy efficiency and energy savings opportunities. Um, so you'll be seeing a lot of us in the community, um, and we'll be working on a variety of activities um, to promote energy uh, education and awareness and help people make their homes more comfortable and also help the city work towards meeting their climate action plan goals. Um, we've been working over the past month to start this initiative with the San Carlos Youth Center. We've been doing a variety of activities, including um, energy efficiency scavenger hunts, um, uh, do-it-yourself energy audits in the San Carlos Youth Center, and we'll be um, culminating the activities with a Earth Day event next week on Wednesday, April 22nd at the Youth Center at 3 p.m., and we invite everyone here and the public to attend. The youth will be showcasing what they've learned and they've um, done over the past few weeks with us, and we'll be kicking off um, our initiative formally with the city at that point. Great. Thank you, Thank you very much. Okay, uh, is there anyone else who would wish to speak on any item not on tonight's agenda? Pardon me? I have, uh, that was Aaron was the last one. Okay. Um, Mr. Mayor? Yes, Mark. Is, is it possible to ask a question of staff, a brief question of staff relating to one of the speakers? Uh, I don't see why not. <laughs> um, I, I, um, Jeff, I just wanted to get a sense from your perspective. Uh, um, Paul Maginetti had mentioned that that uh, um, first responders are concerned about the configuration of Holly Street, I guess. Uh, has that come to your attention? I've heard the comment um, made, I think, by Paul before, but I have not heard that, and I've, and I've asked both chiefs. Um, they hadn't heard that 
uh, either, but I'd ask that they talk to their folks and find out if there are any concerns and get back to me. So. Okay. All right. Um, moving along, approval of the consent calendar. Consent calendar items are considered to be routine and will be enacted by one motion. There will be no separate discussion on these items unless members of the council, staff, or public request specific items to be removed for separate action. Mr. Mayor, I'll move approval of the consent calendar. Okay. Second. Second. Motion and a second. Um, Crystal? Councilmember Grassilli? Yes. Councilmember Grocott? Yes. Councilmember Johnson? Yes. Councilmember Olbert? Yes. Mayor Collins? Yes. Okay. Moving on to. I think since, since I've been on, that's for sure. Okay, um, we are now at item nine, uh, which is a public hearing. Consideration of introducing an ordinance amending Title 18 of the San Carlos Municipal Code consisting of changes to building placement standards in the MU-DC district for the 700 and 800 blocks of Walnut Street and in the MU-D district. Mr. Save, welcome. Good evening, Honorable Mayor, members of the City Council. As a result of the package of zoning changes that were brought before you in uh, January, uh, the Council asked staff to delve deeper into uh, some items that are listed on the screen in front of you. The first one is before you this evening, and the rest we will bring back at a later date. The reason that this one is before you this evening is that we have an active application at 545 Walnut Street for a mixed-use project, and the applicants have been meeting with the neighbor, neighbors and showing them the plans around the neighborhood. And one of the issues that was discussed when this came up at the uh, January City Council meeting was that the front setback uh, required by the zoning code for the project could pose a problem for vehicular and pedestrian safety and neighborhood compatibility issues. Um, the Planning Commission carefully considered this issue at a uh, meeting recently, and staff will be presenting the rationale proposed for a new front setback in this in a couple of zones. Uh, and so what I'm going to do now is I'm going to turn it over to uh, Lisa Porras, our principal planner, and she'll go through the details of this, and we'll be available to answer any questions. Thank you. Good evening, Mayor, members of the Council. Uh, my name is Lisa Porras, Principal Planner, and uh, the Planning Division is actually pleased to be able to bring forward to you the Planning Commission's recommendation to increase the front yard setback in certain areas of the city um, because we think it's an improvement for the areas affected. Um, but before we get into the specific de details of the proposed change, um, I wanted to take this opportunity to kind of allow us to take a look at the overall setting the aerial image on the screen before you basically shows the convergence of residential and mixed-use zoning districts. Everything with an R is a residential district, and all the zones that start with an M are the city's um, different mixed-use districts that kind of really converge, in this case, um, along uh, the 500 block of Walnut. Um, the image is capturing um, basically the north and, si north and south side of uh, the city's uh, downtown core. Um, as you can see in the image, San Carlos Avenue extends westward from the uh, San Carlos Caltrain Station. If we look at the buildings from left to right, if we look at the placement of the buildings and their overall building size, we start to see a change in the physical pattern from one block to the next. And as we read this landscape, um, we note there's likely to be a change in the zoning designation based upon the cues we're, we're looking at um, from the images. Um, and as we know, the zoning is, dictates the way the buildings are constructed and what uses can go within them. So as we started to investigate the potential change uh, to the front yard setbacks, we essentially made several acknowledgments. 
The first one is that we recognize that front setbacks for commercial uses and for residential uses are intentionally different. Residential uses typically require greater setbacks for more privacy and buffer from the public areas, whereas commercial uses should engage pedestrians along the sidewalk and have more of an adjacency feature or connection to the public area. The second thing we understood is that the way in which a storefront sits along the street um, creates a visual cue to passerbys um, that, you know, this is an area that's more commercial. It's a visual cue that there's commercial activity along the street. And in the same way, residential areas that are set back give cues of more privacy and seclusion. The third thing we noticed overall is that all these multiple building types really actually do work together to avoid an architectural monotony, and it provides a unique quality that makes our downtown and the adjacent neighborhoods quite unique. And you see it most often, uh, more than not, in areas where there is a transition. So the mixed-use areas and the residential uh, zones um, typically do provide some of the most unique places in the city because of the, their transitional nature. Um, when we looked at the streetscapes along both sides of the block, one side being RM59 and the other um, MUD, as um, Al Savay noted earlier in, at the introduction of this topic, one side of the street allows a 15-foot front yard setback, whereas on the other side, the MUD, a building could be placed either on the property line or five feet away from the property line. Um, if new buildings were to be constructed today, there would be a potential for a very choppy interface from one block, one side of the block to the next, where you're going to have buildings that are further set back and other ones that would be uh, closer to the street. So um, this provides a little bit of context in terms of um, why we came to the conclusion we did. And I'll turn it over to Jill Lewis, who will actually walk us through the actual zoning amendment. Good evening. Staff looked closely at the building placement standards for all of the mixed-use districts and found that in the transitional districts between multifamily residential and the downtown, there was room for refinement of the front yard setback standards for streets other than El Camino Real, Laurel Street, Elm Street, and San Carlos Avenue. For example, the required front yard setback for properties in the RM59 district, which is our multifamily residential district, is 15 feet. That is the same required front yard setback for an MUDC or an MUD uh, district project if it's 100% residential. The currently required street frontage setback along all other streets uh, for the MUDC and MUD districts is between 0 to 5 feet. So the proposed setback for commercial and mixed-use districts in the, uh, excuse me, mixed-use projects in the MUDC for the 7 and 800 blocks of Walnut Street only, and the MUD districts is 5 feet minimum to 15 feet maximum. As Al previously mentioned, the planning division is currently reviewing a development application at 545 Walnut Street that is currently required to meet the code setbacks of five, 0 to 5 feet. The applicant and architect for the structure at 545 Walnut prefer to have the building set 10 feet in from the front property line. Planning staff received comments from neighbors expressing concerns over driveway visibility and building placement with a front setback of 0 to 5 feet given the setbacks of existing development. So as you can see in front of you, uh, the properties at 535 and 551 Walnut Street are set back from the front property line 12 feet 10 inches and 17 feet 10 inches respectively. Following evaluation of the 500 block of Walnut Street and other areas where the downtown transitions into single use residential neighborhoods, planning staff has found that the zero to five feet maximum doesn't go far enough and should be more reflective of the existing development pattern along the street frontage. To give a visual representation of how this would read on the page, here is the building placement standards table for the mixed use districts. Note that for residential only development, the table refers the reader to uh, the setbacks of the RM59 district. 
Specific streets such as El Camino Real, Laurel Street, San Carlos Avenue, and Elm Street are referenced for commercial and mixed-use developments, and then there's a category for all other streets, which is what we're proposing to amend uh, in the MUDC district for the seven and 800 blocks of Walnut Street only, and for the MUD district. The two minor adjustments to the building placement standards within the MUDC district, which is the seven and 800 and 800 blocks of Walnut Street only, and the MUD district will ensure greater consistency and alignment with existing multifamily residential development and transition areas where two different zoning districts are across the street from one another. In most cases of the amendments to be made, multifamily residential development is on the opposite side of the street. The parcels with the red border are all of the affected parcels. To be clear, this change would only apply to new commercial and mixed use development and would affect the 700, 800 blocks of Walnut Street that are in the MUDC district and parcels uh, that uh, have the all other street street frontage setbacks within the MUD district. Individual notices were mailed to property owners within the MUDC district uh, along the 7 and 800 blocks of Walnut Street and all property owners with the, within the MUD district. Notices were also mailed to all property owners within a 300 foot radius of the affected properties referenced. We also published a notice in the local newspaper and uh, staff received one email from a property owner on Holly Street that would be affected by the change in building placement standards if they were to build a commercial or a mixed use structure. These are the findings that would need to be made in order to recommend the zoning ordinance be amended and planning commission suggests you can make both findings. At this time, staff is available for any questions you have. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Jill. Um, any questions so far? I don't see any lights on, so. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, uh, since there are no uh, questions at the moment, why don't we move on to public comment? Um, I have a speaker slip from Vanessa Navala. Hello, Vanessa. And I'd like some guidance. Um, I recently wrote you a letter about my concerns about the zoning in the 500 block. Um, mainly because the um, mixed-use district side-to-side um, -side setbacks uh, potentially allow wall-to-wall -wall construction or to zero lot line. Um, and so my question is, would this uh, proposition um, that's in front of you apply to the project at 545 Walnut, which my understanding is that the planning application was in early October? Would that, would this, would this apply to them? That's my question. Uh, I believe it would. Am I, am I correct? Well, typically I, it would not, but my understanding, and staff can correct me if I'm wrong, in this case, the uh, developer of that project is uh, open and willing to uh, have the project uh, go forward under these zoning changes. Okay, so the, so the general principle is that the zoning can sort of change under a proposed project if the proposer is amenable. Uh, Correct. Yeah. T typically, once an application is made, um, the city can't then change the rules of the game in terms of uh, development. But, it, but if the project's, pro yeah, if the, in this case, since the project developer is open to those changes, it's not an issue. And also assuming that you haven't had any protest from the 300-foot radius and the other owners and so forth. Okay. So um, so basically now then I'm just looking for guidance because, you know, from my, my point of view, I would sort of want to say that now some other issues have come up about the zoning on 500 Walnut in terms of having no setbacks off side to side, uh, potentially, as long if there's a commercial... If there's a commercial unit in a building going in, it can go all the way to the property line, which to me 
points to a vision of having wall-to-wall -wall construction on that street eventually. And, you know, there's an impact on the already existing residences if properties are built directly on the property line. So um, I was wondering if it made sense to include or re reconsider these zoning changes together, the side to side with the front to back, or whether they would need to be separate. Does that make sense? Uh, I think so. Maybe, uh, maybe Jeff or a member of staff could respond to that. What basically what you're saying is that there are other changes that have that that have come up that you're wondering if these changes would sort of consolidate those into into this particular zoning change. Yeah, because it seems like one one possibility you have is to postpone your decision on this until the other issues are also looked into. Or you could do it piecemeal where you have it, you know, you, you sort of deal with this one and then you deal with the next one. Right. But, you know, okay. just asking. All right. Maybe we could have, uh, maybe Al could respond to that. The, um, the setback standards and in, in all the, the zoning standards have been there since, as you know, since 2011 when the planning and the planning commission and city council uh, carefully reviewed those um, setbacks in the front and the, and the sides. And in, in this case, as the city manager mentioned, we have a applicant who actually would prefer to have uh, a, a more flexibility in the front yard setback. You couldn't make those changes tonight if you wanted to consider um, changes to side yard setbacks, you'd have to send it back through the Planning Commission and uh, it would need to come back to you later. Um, it would be a very significant undertaking. Um, you know, there's some certainty with the codes that you have that were formally carefully considered by the Planning Commission and the City Council. Uh, and, and so, and, and it's sort of, there's, there's marketplace certainty at this point with those side setbacks. And I think to, to say, just to clarify, um, to say that, that you'll have um, a block with zero setbacks in these zones is not quite correct. Um, depending on the way the buildings are situated and the types of uses in the building, you may have a setback on one side but not the other, or you may have some minimal setbacks on both sides, or uh, it just depends on the mix of uses and things like that. Um, with this particular development, we understand there, there are concerns about the setbacks, the side setbacks, and there may need to be some adjustments. Um, to those, and, and it will be going to the Planning Commission in early May for design review, uh, and they may wish to consider it at that time. But again, you, you do have the authority to um, ask this issue to go back to uh, the Planning Commission for further consideration. Um, Al, do you, do you think that there are enough sort of question marks in this that it, it would merit sending it back to the Planning Commission for you know, further review and maybe making some of these adjustments? I personally don't. Okay. Um, I think that with the standards that are in place and the design review that we have and our ability to um, work with an applicant to solve problems where they exist, I think that we have enough flexibility to work through these issues. Um, this is the first time this has come up. It's not, a, it's not a, an issue that um, we've seen over and over again. Um, not to say that you know, it couldn't come up again, but again, the way that our code is designed, it's designed to try and make these buildings fit into a neighborhood with other tools as well. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, thank you, Vanessa. So um, my gui then the guidance, I guess, would be um, that if you agree that it's not a good idea to send it back and include the additional concerns, then um, I'd like some guidance on how to go forward with the actual concerns that I've expressed in the side-to-side -side setbacks in my letter to you. I think you can. We can certainly take it up with with uh, Mr. Zade in the planning department. You can, and you certainly can write us, and we'll make sure that they okay. that they get that information. So I did, and then how do I follow up and make sure that you know something gets really kind of reported on? Like, does it get referred to staff, and is there another staff report? There could be. Jeff, did you want to? Yeah, I mean, this this is a specific project that you have concerns about. No, no. In fact, I mean, the project is what um, elicited the concern. But now that it's there, it's like, wow, the whole block, you know, is potentially affected by. 
not just the project, but the fact that as commercial development comes in, it could be directly on the property line, solid wall, solid wall, solid wall. So, you know, I, I think it's worth looking at. I understand. So what I heard the council say is that is that you're comfortable with the zoning as proposed tonight, that they're not going to be looking at any additional zoning changes right now. Staff constantly monitors the zoning because, as you can imagine, you know, one set of zoning rules, which tries to be broad enough to encompass all the city so that people can, you know, do things with the property that they own, can never be perfect because every property has its unique aspects and every project is slightly different. And so when we see trends that come up, um, if we start to see a growing problem or growing trends that are going in a different direction than the zoning code might have imagined, that's that's typically what would trigger the staff to come back or the council to request a more comprehensive review and changes to zoning. So I think we've got the information from you and, and we'll keep that in mind going forward. So it's not until my concerns become a trend. Is that well, uh, Bob, did you want to through the chair? Uh, through the chair. It was indicated that in May this this proposal or this project is coming before the planning commission. Is that correct? Is that correct, Lisa, or not? Potentially. Is there going to be a public meeting on this project? Okay. So I would recommend, I mean, if I was standing in the street, I'd say, go to the meeting. Yeah, yeah, and, no, we've, and, been, and we've been going I'm, to I meetings. don't know that you have. I apologize. But you're looking for a place to go or something, somebody to talk to. Uh, the planning commission is a public, I understand. But the public, this specific project is coming up. There's where you gotta, you got to start and go with the, with the public public meeting and, and voice your concerns and it starts with the planning commission and it may eventually come to us. Okay. So, I mean, that's what I do because that's a public forum and that's the specific, and then you, you know, I think for, I'm, again, I'm just giving free advice, uh, but that's what I, that's where I'd go and then continue along to monitor the street and what else is going on. But you've got a specific project that is supposed to be, have a public meeting. I'm told, mm -hmm. uh, that's where I'd show. Okay. I mean, cause that's the planning process allows for your input. Right. Right. For that project. Yes, project right. by project. But the street doesn't come up as a whole. No, but you, but you could, again, it could be, you could make the same comments there as you made here. Okay. And depending on whether the, the, the planning commission or whoever is reviewing it may carry it right along and say, you know, maybe there's something we need to look at. And then it moves along the, the process as well as staff. Okay. All right. Thank you. Uh, Mark, did you have a question or a comment? Uh, yes, I did. A question. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, for staff. Um, uh, for the benefit of those of us who were um, not on the council when the changes were made back in 2011, uh, could you could somebody briefly summarize uh, why a distinction was made on the, I guess I would describe them as the side setbacks for the multi-use uh, zoned areas versus the purely residential zoned areas? I'm, I'm trying to understand the difference in the logic. This is coming from someone who wasn't here when the zoning ordinance was updated, but, but I did. But, but have you're a resident expert. <laughs> but I, you know, exactly. I do. We have studied this issue as we look back in the general plan and the materials that we have in our office. Um, this area of the block, we're talking about the right hand side of Walnut Street that is zoned MUD, um, as I mentioned before, kind of is its own area of transition as you move from the downtown into a mixed use downtown setting, more commercial, into a single use, into the single use residential neighborhoods. Um, at the time, um, on the block, um, you have an existing commercial building. It's the county building where Sam Trans is located. And at the other end of the block, there used to be an architectural firm um, in within the historic building at 501 Walnut Street, I believe that's the address, which is now currently a dentist office. So there were some commercial uses already existing in that area. So as the general plan was updated, it acknowledged kind of that side of the block as being one that could potentially have commercial and residential uses coexisting together, providing, you know, certain standards were met. And when the zoning ordinance um, was updated in 2011, it put into place the standards for what types of uses can occur there. Um, that portion of the block, it's not every commercial use that would be allowed. It's uses that are kind of um, less intense than they are on the other side of the block. And as you move down San Carlos Avenue uh, into Laurel Street, 
So it, it was, there was a change made there, but it was kind of a, rec it was more a recognition of what was already taking place. Um, Let me uh, interrupt just because I want to make sure that um, my question was clear. The, the way I'm thinking of this, Lisa, is um, on one side of the street, we have mixed use. On the other side of the street, we have purely residential use, correct? Well, there's a mix. There's there's a okay, yeah. but, but bear with me. The area that's zoned for just residential has the has side setback requirements that are larger than the multi use area. Is that correct? That's correct. I okay. believe there are five so to seven. My, my question is is why the distinction? Because when I look at it, what it looks to me like is, and I think this makes perfect sense, is we were saying, oh, if there are residential If there are residential uses in an area, then we are requiring a greater degree of setback, okay, as opposed to in a commercial area. And if that's the case, then I guess what I'm saying is to me it would seem like if there's any residential use in an area, why not requ require larger set or yeah, require larger setbacks? Okay, so I'll clarify. Um, if someone were to build 100% residential on the right-hand side of the block, they would need to comply with the RM59 standards, which means five to 10 foot side yard setbacks, a 15 foot front setback. Mm -hmm. um, however, if they choose to do mixed use, they can, sorry, if they choose to do mixed use, the ground floor commercial component can have up to a zero or can have as little as a zero side yard setback. And the residential units above, and this is actually written into our code, can have um, setbacks that range anywhere between 5 to 10, 15 feet, um, where the units have windows exposed on the exterior side elevations. So, and this is intended to address issues related to um, buffers and privacy, to really kind of pull the building wall in where you have sleeping quarters and primary living areas such as living rooms and restrooms. Those, those are built into the code. So, for example, um, the project at 545 Walnut on one side has to be pulled in where those windows are for residential units are located. And then on top of that, the building code requires um, certain setbacks um, where there's openings um, along the walls, whether those are doorways or windows, it's just for uh, fire safety issues. So to get to 100% 100 wall to wall is very unlikely given that the likelihood of developing the whole block is 100% commercial, you know, it's, it's not likely that that would occur. I understand. I, I guess I, I, um, for the benef for the benefit of, of my colleagues, I actually still see a bit of a difference here in the sense that um, uh, on one, in one area we're saying where there are residential properties or residential use, let's say, because some of the properties are mixed use, we are according uh, – uh, a greater setback than we are in another area. Uh, if anybody else is interested in, in this, I would not be opposed to having a discussion uh, at some point, sending staff back to look at maybe we should think about revising the zoning rules to account for that. Um, in other words, to recognize that the residential usage is the sort of highest and best use um, as far as the setback requirements are concerned. But, in, uh, but, you know, if, if nobody else is interested, then it's just sort of a discussion that's not going to go anywhere. So if I may interrupt, Mr. Seve, is there anybody else who's interested in such a discussion? Um, well, personally, I'd like to hear Al's response before I think we talk about it a little bit more. Uh, through the mayor, I, I'd just like to clarify um, something for Council Member Olbert. And I think, I think what I heard a little bit was, um, well, wh why do you need a zero foot setback just because it's commercial versus residential? I thought that's a little bit where you were going with this. What's the technical distinction between the two? And I, I may be wrong, but I, I'm not sure that we were clear on that. And, and I'd like to clarify that a little bit. If it's not important, then I, I won't. But I think it is important in terms of why you would allow for a zero set, setback for commercial development on a frontage. There is a reason for that. And if you'd like me to clarify, I will. If you don't, that's fine. Uh, for me, actually, the, my question was more in the residential component of a multi-use, which in this case, for example, the second floor 
Okay. Oh, I see. Okay. Why, why do we not say, well, it must be set back because it is a residential use? On both sides. On both sides. Got That's it. correct. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Okay. Um, is there anyone else like to speak? This is a public hearing. Mr. <coughs> Davids. Mr. Mayor and members of the council, while we're going through all this, it suddenly occurs to me that we're also talking about the 700 block, and I'm the current president of the Civic Garden Club, who owns the, pro the uh, Casa de Flores at 737 Walnut. So we're in the middle of that block. The question I have is when we talk about setback, are we talking about setback from the curb, or are we talking about setback from the present internal line of the sidewalk? Can anybody answer that? Okay. It's from the front property line. So typically that's, typically it's behind the sidewalk. Sometimes the right of ways, you know, change depending on the street a little bit, can go a little bit in, a little bit back behind the sidewalk, but it's from the property line and not from the front of the curb. So the property line would be, let's say the internal line of the sidewalk, the reason I ask that is there is a project pending on that block, and uh, that's being evaluated as we speak. We're also dealing with a very narrow street, which really requires people to duck out in order for cars to get through. But there's plenty of room to widen that street if we take a portion of the uh, area between the curb and the internal line of the sidewalk. Unless, of course, we're developing to the sidewalk line, and then that would be a problem. So there's some considerations as far as the uh, future is concerned uh, that perhaps ought to be uh, considered as projects come along the uh, pike. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Al, I, I'd just like to ask, uh, it, uh, is our zoning, the way it's written now, does that address Tom's concerns? Yeah, the... the 777 Walnut, is that the address? Yeah, it was a 20-unit condo project, and it was already approved by the Planning Commission. Mm -hmm. It does have a front set back there. I don't recall what it was. Six inches to five feet was the setback in that location from the, from the front property line. So that one's already been approved. And it was widely reviewed by the neighbors there. Um, there was a good deal of, of outreach on that project. And again, had public hearings and and all that kind of stuff. So, um, so these changes tonight don't do necessarily they particular. don't affect that particular. That's project. correct. Okay, thank you. Is there anyone else that would wish to speak on this? Uh, when you're done, sir, you just fill out a speaker slip. Um, I own the property across from the uh, Garden Club. I I'm sorry. Could you just give us your name? Larry Ercolini. Thank you, Larry. Um, I own 744 Walnut Street. Um, and my concern is also, if you look at the uh, sidewalk lines in the 800 block and the 600 block of Walnut, they're five foot further east, taken from the east side of Walnut Street, which would be the Garden Club side. Is there any future plan to bring those in line? Because that street... Um, as Mr. Davis has, has mentioned, it, it's a disaster with the trucks trying to get through there, the garbage trucks in the morning, any deliveries, it's, uh, and Bianchini's uses it for deliveries. Um, it, it's, and all the kids coming in at 5 o'clock in the evening, it just seems to me that it's long overdue that those the 800 block and the, six, the 700 block needs to line up with the 800 and the 600 block. I don't know, I guess if you guys are aware of that, uh, I'm sure you must be when you look at the, if there's anything in the, you know, in the offing where that may be, where that might come up. Uh, I, I don't know, maybe the staff can speak to it. it. It sounds to me like, again, the, the changes that we're making is going to affect those blocks as well. Am, am, am I correct on that? Understood. Okay. And, and, you know, we've, we've heard about congestion on that part of Walnut Street. It is a, a sort of narrows down in that area, but... Um, to my knowledge, there's no plans to widen the street, I think, and maybe uh, realign the street a little bit is what I think I heard you say.
And so that's more of a public work street, you know, alignment issue as opposed to a, a setback issue. And, and to my knowledge, there's no plans to do that. Of course, the public if, works. If we, if we realign the streets, then obviously the setbacks are going to change as well. Yes, that's, right. that's true. Okay. Yes. All right. Thank you. Anyone else wish to speak? Good evening and thank you. I'm John Anagnostu, part of the uh, ownership group for uh, 545 Walnut. The reason why this has come up is because of us, uh, to allow that uh, 0 to 5 to go to 5 to 15. Uh, it, it's reasonable. It's right. It's basic. It's not just for line, plain, uh, plane of line for the properties, but for safety. That was where biggest concern was because of the abutment being so close to the road. So in terms of, you know, side setbacks, um, the only thing I want to say about that is, you know, we do have a, a you've gone through an arduous process for trying to figure out, you know, all your districts and through your 2030 um, general plan and a lot of neighborhood meetings that you went through to get this right. And so with, with that, there are certain things that we can do. You have certainly case precedents of properties that have been already built. Uh, six, uh, 656 Walnut, for example, it's a zero lot line. So you can do things um, aesthetically that, you know, can enable, you know, those kind of things to be mitigated in a fair and reasonable way. Thank you. All right. Thank you, John. All right. Anyone else wishing to speak? Okay. Mr. Mayor, I make a motion to uh, <clears throat> close the public hearing. All right. Second. A second. All right. Um, do we need a roll call for this, Crystal? We do. Okay. We need a motion. Do we not? Yes. I, yeah, well, I made the oh, motion sorry. to close oh, you're the right. hearing. You're right. I was, I was jumping ahead. Sorry. Okay. Councilmember Gracilli? Yes. Councilmember Grocott? Yes. Councilmember Johnson? Yes. Councilmember Obert? Yes. Mayor Collins? Yes. Okay. Um, all right. Uh, any other questions or discussions by anybody? I'm not seeing anybody that <coughs> jumping forward to speak. So I think maybe we need a motion. Well, I'll, I'll be happy to make the motion and then we can discuss, I'm sure. Okay. Uh, move to introduce ordinance. 1485. 1485, an ordinance of the City Council of the City of San Carlos amending Title 18 of the San Carlos Municipal Code consisting of changes to building placement standards in the MU-DC district for the 700 and 800 blocks of Walnut Street and in the MU-D district. Second. All right. There's a motion and a second. Now I think we are ready for any discussion. And again, I'm not seeing it. Okay. Crystal? Councilmember Grassilli? Yes. Councilmember Grocott? Yes. Councilmember Johnson? Yes. Councilmember Obert? Yes. Mayor Collins? Yes. Okay. Mr. Mayor, may I assume that uh, there is no interest in pursuing the suggestion I had made? That's not true. Okay. Okay. I, I have an interest in it. You have an interest in it. Uh, I apologize, Mark. Can you just restate that so we can all hear it again and make sure that uh, we uh, vote on it correctly? Well, it's not a matter of voting. It'd be a future agenda or, topic, or just agree on it. Yeah, it, it's it's to have staff come back and make a presentation to us so that we can have a discussion about uh, whether or not we would like to uh, uh, tweak the zoning rules so that whenever there is a residential use on a property, that that the uh, um, I will call them the residential style setbacks are are uh, applied. I'm not. I'm not understanding what you're saying. I apologize. Um, right now, right now, the setbacks in the multi-use district are such that if there is a commercial use on a property, that the side setbacks uh, can be as zero. can be zero. Right. Right. And uh, the question would be whether or not we want to change that in the zoning so that they could not go down to zero. They could go down to some you know smaller number, but not zero. Um, are we? Are we all, Mr. I'm, Mayor? Just, yes. I just want to make a comment on on a, the a process for additional changes um, that are being are uh, being discussed. Um, the uh, or or additional agendizing. Remember that if it comes back to the city council, since this is a zoning ordinance change, it it does have to go to the planning commission. 
before the city council approves um, any kind of change to the zoning ordinance. So you could have a study session item and talk about in general uh, those types of zoning changes, but it always would have to go back to the planning commission. And just to be clear, because I know I was being specific in answering Bob's question, that actually having the study session is what I'm proposing. Okay, is is we can't tonight we can't tonight discuss whether or not we want to direct staff to go back and do the whole big process. I'm asking whether we want to even discuss it because if we don't want to discuss it, then there's no point in doing anything. Okay, so uh, you'd like to have that, Matt? You said you agreed. And uh, I didn't hear from anybody else. I actually think it probably wouldn't be a bad idea to have the discussion. So maybe we could uh, uh, agendize that for a study session. Okay. Thanks, um, you're welcome. On to new business. Uh, item 10A, consideration of introducing an ordinance amending municipal code section 3.12, adding preference for vendors and non-professional services utilizing environmentally sustainable materials, products, or methods in the city of San Carlos. I think this is my staff report, Mr. Mayor. Um, this um, ordinance, um, proposed ordinance, um, adds to the municipal code a preference for environmentally sustainable materials, products, or methods. Um, the government code, um, as stated in the staff report 54,202, provides that local agencies uh, must have a purchasing um, ordinance. Um, what this does is adds another feature to our existing purchasing ordinance and uh, requires consideration of a environmentally preferred purchasing policy, which is in draft form only right now, but um, it's anticipated that, that that would come back to the council for review um, are close to or around the time that the effective date of the ordinance um, is in place. So um, I think it's fairly self-explanatory um, what's being considered. It's just it's a preference and there's a policy direction that will that you will act on at a later date with the specific policies. Okay. Um, any questions of Mr. Rubens? Uh, I'm sorry. Bob? Um, Greg, so I guess I'm, I'm trying to figure out, um, so I'm tr I want to sell something to the city, uh, and uh, I come in and you won't, and let's say this was in effect, so there's a questionnaire, there's a, due diligence, uh, I just say, hey, I'm doing recycled, I got recycled paper and I'm using environmentally, environmentally sustainable materials and products and so can I have the contract? Well, uh, it, the, the, if you look at the draft policy, it's basically a consideration of those types of factors. And unfortunately, you know, because of the, we, we want to have the ordinance um, process moving at the same time as and have so we could have the ordinance and the policy effective at the same time but it didn't make sense to if the council wasn't interested in pursuing this to have the, spend the time on a final sure. policy so what would happen is if someone comes in to sell the city um, a, a product um, or a service they would go through they they, they would have it in front of them the, the actual policy that would guide use of, and purchase of those types of supplies or, or services and that would be become part of their bid and then the staff in reviewing the purchase of the of the services would review that and provide a, a preference to those um, I, I, I get yeah. that what's the what's the proof that they're doing any of it well, they they would that's, have that's that. Where I'm, that's where that. I'm getting lost. Oh, well, that would be part of their their bid. How they would how so they how would they, how would they prove it? How would they prove it? Well, they, they're using they're, recycled paper. Well, there'd be a contract in place after okay. they went through the bid, and they would be legally obligated to comply with with their bid, and which includes the and environment. How would we check it? Um, well, we would check it like we check any other uh, any other contract provision. We'd verify it, but. Well, that's I see, that's, see. That's where I'm getting. That's yeah. where I'm getting confused, or I'm, I have issues. I'm not sure how we how it's enforceable. That's where I'm trying to. I, like I just said, I said I got all this stuff, and I'm doing it, and I'm a good guy. I'm environmental. 
I think I understand what you're saying. Yeah. Not not every one of these provisions would be verified by staff. Sure. You're you're correct. Um, you know, if a pro if a product was sold to us as being 100% recycled paper, mm -hmm. and it was marketed and labeled that way, and then you know ultimately the city discovered or somebody else discovered that this company was misrepresenting their product, they sure. we would then find out and they'd be in violation of their contract, and the city attorney would have. The tools to I, go paper, back and paper. I can sort of understand them. a lot of that's marked, and I mean, I sort of believe right. sometimes. But some of this other the uh, the uh, the other sons of the other items are a little more. I don't know. There's a checklist. You know, right. That's the thing that's hard for me to get my right. arms around. It's more a sure. guideline for staff to be able to ask the right questions when okay. making uh, purchases is in terms of guidelines. Okay. Um, as opposed to something that we would necessarily have to go out and scientifically verify, okay. for example. Just thank you. All right, Mark. Um, the uh, uh, thank you. I was just going to say that that I think it's a good question, Bob. Uh, in practice, an awful lot of what we buy is verified after the fact on an exception basis. I mean, the thought that came to my mind was all the computers we buy. They're specced out in a certain way, but we actually wouldn't know unless we opened up the cases or something went wrong where they put some cheap memory in there that, that we hadn't specced out. So um, uh, the question I have is a little bit related to Bob's, though, uh, Jeff, which is um, uh, I like this policy. I think it's, it's good to have it in place. But um, can you help me out in how staff manages to trade off some of these things against each other? I mean, for example, uh, Cameron and I both submit a bid. I'm using he's using sustainable materials. I'm not. My bid is 10% less than his. How do you decide who to award it to? Well, I think um, give it to me one more time. You're the yours. You're the I'm environmental the analyst. I'm the, I'm the non-sustainable. I'm the cheap polluter. Cameron <laughs> is the Cameron is the uh, Cameron the, is the 10% more expensive. Right. Uh, but yeah, he, but well, he's he's being sustainable. Right. You know, I think you're going to look at the dollars in the budget involved. You know, for example, if we're talking about a $10 million purchase, that 10% just got to be a real number, um, maybe pushing us beyond the budget. We may have to go back to the council for authorization. Uh, you may be talking about pens and pencils, in which case the city may be spending $400 annually on pens and pencils, in which case um, the dollar amount really isn't that critical us in, in having a more uh, environmentally sustainable option uh, might be the way to go. Can I, can I maybe ask a clarifying question? Sure. So, so yeah. under, under our current policies, staff doesn't have the flexibility to choose a premium vendor um, or more expensive vendor who might be more environmentally conscious. So this essentially gives staff that option. Is that right? Yes and no. I mean, we do have the option to do that now. We're not bound to purchase the lowest bid pens that, that we can find. We do have flexibility in our purchasing now. I think this is more of providing guidelines that don't exist now on a, an emerging issue that's becoming more and more important to our society and our organization uh, so that the staff has an understanding, that they understand that the council values that uh, and wants that part of the decision-making process. Okay, Matt? I'm sitting here um, trying to think of some examples, so I'm just going to ask you to give them to me, of you know, when this becomes an issue. Bob mentioned paper. I would imagine the city's, you know, much like most businesses, you buy recycled paper, um, so don't you know? We don't need to talk about paper, and uh, we already know what we've done with most of the light bulbs in this facility. I'm I'm just you know at a uh, uh, personally, of course, I don't do your job every day or their job every day, so I don't know when do you run into this and what's the magnitude of it. Purchasing is done every day throughout City Hall, uh, throughout all our all our, all our buildings. Um, you know, totals millions of dollars a year. Um, you, you know, if you add up all the various categories, um, but 
purchasing in general at sort of the level we're talking about is relatively routine, even if we're purchasing, say, a new vehicle, new truck for the courtyard or uh, maybe something not like a Vactor truck, but, you know, a pickup truck or a new fleet car or something for the city. These are all fairly routine transactions, business transactions for the city. Under this policy, they would remain routine business transactions. We have a number of existing guidelines uh, related to purchasing policies in the city, how you purchase, what process you have to go through. This is just adding another component to it. Um, you know, this is coming from the staff. We don't feel that this would be an onerous requirement for us to be able to make purchases going forward. But I'm, I'm just, so, so you've answered all the questions about magnitude and, you know, how often and so forth, but I'm still uh, looking for other examples besides what Bob has already mentioned, you know, paper for the copy machines. You know, what are we talking about here? Right, I think I think we're talking about everything that the city purchases. So um, that could be... Um, Recreation supplies for recreation programs, um, you know, you know, say there's a more environmentally friendly tennis ball, for example, um, we might purchase that uh, uh, through, you know, all the various office supplies, equipment, furniture, carpeting, possibly, um, you know, all those kinds of things. Just the environmental factor would just become one preference. What is it made of, in other words? So I have a good example that's right in front of us. We have a, screen, a computer screen that has Energy Star label on it. Now, if we got a, a bid that came in for a proposal to sell us computer monitors that had Energy Star and one that didn't, this policy gives us the ability to say, well, even though the Energy Star might be a little bit more, it's in the ballpark, and we can purchase that. Didn't you just say, though, that we, we have that ability now? We, we have some ability to do that based on quality of product, based upon the specifications that we said in the bid, in the, in the bid document. But this does give a tangible and a, um, indication to it and provides the, the, the draft policy is, a, is like an instruction to city um, employees who are buying things. So if they know that's in place, they're going to set up a bid process that's going to encourage these types of uh, energy saving and environmentally preferable products. Okay. Those are my questions. Yeah, All right. Sure. Um, the question I have is, are there, are, is this something that other cities are, are doing sort of slowly or methodically? Is, I mean, is it a process, sort of a movement that's already begun, and we're just, you know, following a trend? We're sort of memorializing a trend that is that began a while back and is now a well, movement. Actually, it did begin a while back when we adopted our climate action plan in two thousand and nine. This was one of the goals. Okay. So uh, there are communities uh, that are using environmental purchasing program uh, plans, and we actually asked for many of examples when we were researching this. And so uh, I'd say yes. I don't know how many. I couldn't give you a percentage, but there are a number of them. Yeah. All right. But, I mean, it sounds to me like we're basically saying to vendors, look, we prefer that you sell us or that you offer us uh, environmentally uh, uh, responsible products or something that's a product of attempting to, to make uh, to better use our resources, absolutely, and also some of the bigger organizations such as Office Depot, mm -hmm. things of that nature, are actually offering a whole variety of green products. Okay, so it, I don't know. It it sounds to me like a case of sort of we're just sort of sort of making official uh, a, a practice that began long ago. You know, that sort of. Like the plastic bag ordinance, we passed a law, but a lot of people were there. There was already a movement away from plastic bags. I mean, this is not an ordinance. This is, this is an ordinance, but it's for preference and not saying we have to do this, right? right? And it gives vendors the idea that hey, you know, the city is interested in something that's more green and environmentally friendly product. Right. Let's offer the, that to them as an option. Where sometimes they just might oh, let's give them the cheapest option. Right. And it's not a mandated thing. Okay. All right. 
Okay. Um, I don't see any other questions. This is, uh, we are accepting public comment on this. Is there anybody who would like to speak on this issue? All right. Seeing none. Mr. Mayor, I'll move that we uh, introduce um, an ordinance. Introduce ordinance. 1486. 1486. Right. Thank you. An ordinance of the City Council of the City of San Carlos amending Municipal Code Section 13.12, adding preference for vendors and non-professional services utilizing environmentally sustainable materials, products, or methods in the City of San Carlos. Through the chair, I apologize. I think it's 3.12. I don't mean to be technical. Didn't I say 3.12? That's okay, but I meant 3.12. <laughs> I second with okay. 3.12. Motion and second. Any discussion? Seeing none, Crystal, call the roll, please. Councilmember Grassilli? Yes. Councilmember Grocott? No. Councilmember Johnson? Yes. Councilmember Obert? Yes. Mayor Collins? Yes. Okay, moving on to item 10B. Um, consideration of introducing an ordinance amending municipal code section 5.04.120 adding mobile food facilities as a business type and updating fee amounts to reflect past and future increases under section 5.04.090. This is another ordinance, Mr. Mayor, that I, I think I'll take the lead on since I drafted it. Um, the there's two main purposes for this uh, proposed ordinance. Um, one is to add mobile food facilities um, as a business type. Um, right now our code did not specify that type of business um, for purposes of business registration and staff has had some uh, experience, some uh, misunderstanding uh, among uh, applicants as to what type of license they would have. Uh, excuse me, what type of registration they, they should, um, what category they should be under. Um, the second purpose of the ordinance is to update the monetary values that are in the current ordinance. Um, it's been some time since those monetary values have um, been updated and staff from time to time, um, uh, because the, the actual fee that's been adjusted by 4% each year since the initial um, enactment of the ordinance has taken place is different than what the ordinance says. So they, they get some um, also confusion or um, misunderstanding among the public. So the second purpose is to reset those numbers. Um, I'm going to be very clear, this does not increase the business registration fees. They are exactly the same as they currently are, it's just so the ordinance while we're at making the, the change to the business type, it seemed like a prudent time to update the numbers. They will continue to, to adjust at 4% each year. That part of the code is not being changed. So with that, if there's any questions, and Rebecca Mendenhall is here as well for, uh, to answer any questions. Any questions of Greg or Rebecca? Uh, Bob? Um, I'm sorry, Greg. Um, so what does the current uh, ordinance say for dollar cents and percentages? The percentage increase is 4%. It's the same. We're not okay. changing that okay. section at all. The um, the numbers, uh, I think that's in my staff report, and I may have... Um, I, I tried to figure it out, but I couldn't. That's why I'm asking the question. I'll have to look at the actual code um, and get you that answer to that question. Okay. Well, I, like I said, I'm just trying to understand. It, was it $12, now it's 94 Was it... Uh, well, sixteen dollars now. It's one hundred seventy. Well, just there's the. It's just the code text has a low number that's been adjusted four percent each year ever since then. Uh -huh. So all I'm doing is updating those numbers to the actual number oh, okay. that's being charged right. right now. Okay, so it's the same number. You just I understand. Okay, now I get it. Are, do we? Uh, so this affects the. Um, so I guess down at uh, Hiller they have uh, trucks. Are those the ones that it affects? It, it would affect some of those and some other um, mobile food facilities that come into town on a temporary basis. Yeah. Okay. Um, we are trying to um, capture that that um, those businesses that actually do business in town. Okay. So. Thank you. Okay, uh, Mark, you had a question. Yes. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Actually, I had two. Um, uh, Greg, um, so from that last comment you made to to Bob, it sounds like there are. Some instances of vendors who 
what have not been who haven't had a business license because the regulations weren't sufficiently clear well i think there's an argument that when you read the current code that we could say you you are under this category um and Rebecca maybe has more familiar with the exact, exact category that we would put them in under our current code. But since there's been such an increase in these types of businesses that, that come into town, um, it, it was felt uh, with staff that it would be much better from an administrative standpoint to have an actual definition in our code so that's very unambiguous and clear. Uh, uh, great supporter of removing ambiguity in, in code. I guess what I was really wondering is, are, were there people who were not having licenses but still operating businesses in San Carlos? That's probably the case, yes. Okay. Yes. I mean, we're trying to enforce in the uh, business registration as well. Mm -hmm. And with the increase in the mobile food vendors at Hiller and at, um, at the brewery, we just want to make sure that we know how to charge them, and it's very clear in our code. Okay. Um, thank you. My second question, which may also be a Re Rebecca question, uh, um, historically, do you know why we picked 4% as the annual increase factor? Uh, that has been in our code for a very long time. I'm, I don't know exactly how the 4%, I, maybe Greg, the city manager knows. Do, do you happen to know the history of why we picked 4%? I, I do not, but I can find out for you. Um, yeah, I, I, you can, I think back when that ordinance was done, it was intended to be a, a mid-range, my guess, but then I don't know for sure, it would be a, like a mid-range COLA adjustment that would, that would that cover would be, administrative costs. That would be my guess, too, um, but it's 4% is actually somewhat higher than inflation has been for a number of years. Um, and, and I don't know how administratively complex it would be if the code had been written to say, you know, using some inflation index because then you'd have to go look it up every year. But if you can educate me offline on what the history of it is and I can decide whether I want to bring it back up. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Mark. Um, Matt, you had a question? Yeah. Did um, you have a question of Rebecca since she's standing here? Or just a general question of, of, of Greg? I don't know who it's for. It's just for staff. Okay. So, um, My understanding is that you know fees are charged when a service is rendered. So you pay a, you know, like a building permit fee if you're getting a build, building permit. You got guys coming out on your job site looking at your project. Um, on this, I'm, I'm really uh, struggling to see what's the service that's being provided. We're charging a fee and there's no service that I can see. Businesses that do business in San Carlos need to pay a registration fee, and that's but, what this is. Even when you register your vehicle and you pay a registration fee for your vehicle, you you know there's a service there because now you're set up for receiving your license plate and so on and so forth. Um, again, all I see this is it's just a registration fee. What's the service? Service says your business has been verified by the city and that you have been approved to do business. We also not only register, but we do zoning checks. Mm -hmm. So we make sure that your business is zoned for the area that you're doing business in. Mm -hmm. hmm. All right. Okay. Um, any other questions? So far? Okay. This is also a new uh, new business item. I'm, uh, is there any public that would like to comment on it? Okay. Seeing none. Mr. Mayor, Sir? I move to introduce ordinance. 1487. 1487, an ordinance of the city, of San, the city council of the city of San Carlos amending municipal code section 5-04-120, adding mobile food facilities as a business type and updating fee amounts to reflect past and future increases under section 5.04.090. Second. All right, we have a motion and a second. Any discussion? Matt. I would like to discuss the uh, percentage. It's been, you know, there for, oh, thank you. I wasn't expecting that. Yeah, worse. I'm your friend. 
that that four percent's been there a long year, uh, a long time, and you know maybe the first year you pay it, four percent is not a great amount, but four percent on four percent on four percent on four percent year after year after year after year really starts to add up, and uh, I think it, it to the point where it becomes belligerent, and uh, I think lowering that to something that's more reasonable in line with where inflation's been. Uh, would make a heck of a lot more sense. So I would like to, if we're going to pass this, I, you know, I, I think I, Mark was hinting at bringing this back perhaps after a meeting with staff, but I would be for uh, changing this to something more reasonable like 2%. Um, before I respond, I want to ask a question on our the rest of our fees of Jeff or anybody in staff. Let's take building fees, permit fees. Are they tied to any inflationary measure? Or do we adjust them from time to time as we feel it necessary? They're tied more to the cost of doing business, the cost of processing the application as opposed to some inflationary index. Mm -hmm. So our cost may go up greater than inflation, which for a municipality actually traditionally would be the case that most municipalities... Uh, uh, costs rise slightly higher than the cost of inflation typically. Um, this particular one predates me. It's been in the code a long time, the 4%. So I can't tell you exactly why 4% was picked. Um, you go back far enough and for a number of years, 4% would have been a really good deal. Right. Exactly. Um, you know, so it, can, it cuts both ways mm -hmm. um, historically, even though, you know, for a good time now, um, Inflation has been rather low. Um, there's been periods of time where <laughs> that's not been the case. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, normally, and I, that's what I was thinking. It was just historically, it has four percent is probably. I mean, if you go back a hundred years, four percent probably seems rather mild. Um, anyway, Bob, you had a comment. Well, I was going to ask uh, Rebecca. What, this is a business license, and so what do we do with our normal business licenses? I'm just trying to, what's the normal increase? Is there an increase? I think, as I remember paying it for a number of years, there was an increase each year. How did we determine that? It's uh, The business registration has always been 4% for so the ordinance. For, for all business licenses? Yes. Okay. I just, I just want to make sure we're, I, I apologize. I just want to make sure it was for everything. All right. Thank you. All right. Well, I think, maybe give me some help here, uh, we, we probably uh, should take a vote, and then maybe we can talk about agendizing potentially an, a, a discussion of the fees that we charge in the future. Mr. Mayor. Do you want to make it contingent on that? I'm going to make my vote contingent on that. I, I think the other thing, if we're going to bring it back, uh, however, the discussion could be either have a percent increase that's fixed and gets reviewed again, or there's no reason that these fees can't be included with all the other fees that we do every year when we do budget. And we review the fees and whether or not they should go up and, you know, staff adjust them, like they say, based on uh, the time that's spent doing whatever, you know, the different things that are done. Uh, frankly, I think what that would bring in is a, my original comment that I, I just see this as a, really, I see this as a tax it is not a fee. All it's doing is bringing in revenue to the city. I, I see very little correlation to anything that's a service, yet all the businesses are paying a fee. So, But at least if we could have something that, uh, in terms of this process, again, that th there's no reason it can't be incorporated with all the other fees that we, we look at every year. Right. Mark, your light's not on, but since you brought this up... I just want to get your what your thoughts on this. Um, well, I, I haven't changed what I said earlier, which is that I, I want to have a chance to talk to staff about the history of this. And there's a, I have a lot of questions about, you know, that could very well result in me not having an issue of any kind with the 4% figure. Um, and that's, those are not things that we're going to resolve tonight. I'm fine going ahead with, with the, uh, the ordinance as proposed. Um, uh, we can separately discuss whether we want to bring something back, or if, Matt, if you want to propose a, an amended ordinance and see if there's a second, you know, we can do it that way too. Um, but I hope that answers your question, Mr. Mayor. Yes. 
It does. Bob? I, one quick question. Is this the only thing that has a fixed 4% or fixed anything in our, in our fees and, and licenses and things? Sorry. Is fixed in the ordinance. Right, but is this the, the other fees that come forward come forward every year in the right. spring. So this is the only. This is a unique thing. Unique. That's what, that's what I'm trying to identify. Thank you. Okay. But it's for every business registration. It's the only thing in our code that has a fixed four percent bang every time. The rest I know is reviewed. As like you say, the cost of what it costs us to do and so on. So, thank you. All right, uh, Matt. So. Similar to what Mark did on the other issue with the setbacks, uh, is that a thing I can ask right now? Is there an interest on the dais to have this uh, particular fee structure come back in terms of the percent increase, that part of the ordinance, and have us take a look at that uh, as a, either a study session or however you want to approach it? Well, I, I was thinking that we'd, we'd I mean, we can vote take on care of this. We'd vote yeah. on this now, and then we can we can then talk about whether or not we want to bring it back. All right. All right. Uh, Crystal? Councilmember Grisilli? Yes. Councilmember Grocott? No. Councilmember Johnson? Yes. Councilmember Obert? Yes. Mayor Collins? Yes. Okay. Um, item 10C. Uh, oh, oh, I'm we sorry. Got to... um, I guess we can... You want to bring it up now? We can just see if we want to agendize it. You were referring to? I just wanted to give Matt an opportunity to right. have, have the idea vetted, or not All vetted, right. but uh, brought up. All right. Sorry, I, Matt. I was. Right. So, is there an interest in agendizing that particular 4% as it applies to this fee? Normally, I'm not much for, for having more work for staff on a lot, some of these items. I'm not really supportive, but I can't, if this is the only one that's in there, I can't really understand why it's the only one. I mean, I'm not looking at you directly. I'm just, I just don't understand why this is the only one that has a fixed amount as opposed to cost of, you know, what it costs to do. Now, if city staff has a, a, a reason, I, I'd, I'd love to hear it, but it seems like it just, it's been there forever, and it doesn't seem like a lot, but as Matt said, 4% times 4% times 4%. It, it goes up, and I'm not saying it shouldn't go up 4%. Maybe that's what the cost is of, of having to do it. It might be 5%, it might be 6 I mean, I'm not against that right. either. But uh, I just, you know, if, if that's the um, desire of the council, we'll go back and research it and provide you with um, information those questions. I suspect this has been in the code a long time and actually probably goes back to, the, to a point in time when this was a tax and it was likely exempted out of the law becoming a business license. Um, cities, municipalities have uh, the ability to and, and obligation to do business licenses, and um, we can provide you with a whole host of information of what we do with that information, uh, both in terms of tracking data, uh, zoning information, and public safety in terms of um, using that information to do sprinkler checks and all that kind of uh, stuff. So there is a public benefit to uh, this type of licensing, just like there's a public benefit to requiring licensing for dogs and cats. And I'm not again. I'm, I just I think it's just a matter of is four percent enough? Is it too much? I, I, I it's the I, only one. It's the only item. In our, apparently in our fees and, yeah. and things that we charge. I'm happy to do it because I suspect okay. when we study this, if we were to study this like a normal fee, we'll find that the costs aren't nearly enough. Okay. Well, like I said, I'm... All right. This might be one of those cases of be careful what you wish for. Okay. Uh, anyone else in favor of bringing, agendizing this? Or ha asking staff to study it? We have two so far. Um, I'll add my name, so... Okay. All right. Now we move on to item 10C. Um, consideration of selecting an appropriate monument for the dedication of Frank D. Harrington Park at 729 Laurel. Good evening, Mayor Collins, members of the City Council, Christine Boland, Parks and Recreation Director. The action before you this evening is to select the appropriate monument for the dedication of the Frank D. Harrington Park at 729 Laurel Street. Just a, by way of background, this uh, park is formerly Laurel Street Park, constructed in the 90s, and I do recall when it was a flat 
dirt lot I'd, I'd walk by all the time. It was constructed using donations from residents and local businesses. It's heavily used, as you know, during Farmer's Market and the Art and Wine Festival. And um, you authorized the renaming of the park just a couple months ago on January 26, after the passing of longtime resident and police community volunteer Frank Harrington. I want to take a brief moment to talk about the condition of the park. And I purposely delayed the project a bit for two reasons. The park was not ready for a dedication or any type of uh, uh, ceremony or party because of the, um, um, the heavy use by the, the groups and residents that I just mentioned. So I, I um, got together a little bit of funding from the Parks and Recreation Foundation. We've, um, if you've been by there recently, you'll notice that there's construction fencing up. We've put in sod plants and new bark, so it looks really nice right now. And the uh, sod is still being established. We will pressure wash right before the event, so this park will be nice and uh, sparkly. Um, staff reviewed hundreds, if not thousands, of different types of monuments, signs, plaques, archways, etc., using different materials. We had quite a fun time narrowing it down to four options for the council, and at this time it's appropriate for you all to select the most fitting sign or monument for the park. Starting with option one, this is our standard city park sign. We can make them in-house, but it's um, also an option to send it out. It's a cost approximately $4,500. Option two is a plaque. Um, we honed down the selection, and I'll show you that in one moment. It's a cement with a brick base engraved depicting the facial image and a brief description of Mr. Harrington's volunteer work, estimated to be about $10,000. And this was the preferred option of the Parks and Recreation, Parks, Recreation and Culture Commission at their meeting in February. This is a replica of what, um, what I'm talking about, and it could be taller or a little bit wider if we so choose. Option three is an archway sign. I thought this was a great option. Um, it spans the width of the park and establishes a gateway entry into the park, which currently has no sign or any indication of its name. Approximately $90,000. These are different. Um, I've brought up two or three different images just to show you. I don't, I'm not crazy about that font, but, um, but there's different ways that you can accomplish the same mission with an archway, which I think would look nice also. Uh, we actually measured it on Google here, so it would work. Option four is actually um, my... Preference. It's a combination of one and two, and it establishes the park sign, which never existed before, and also um, incorporates the Park and Rec Commission recommendation, approximately $14,000 for that, which is a small sign for Harrington Park and uh, the monument sign. Depending on what uh, selection you choose, we will be able to, uh, to uh, move funds around and and fund this option, your option, and um, available for questions. Thank you very much. All right, thank you, Christine. I think Mark has some questions for you. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Christine. Um, uh, actually, two questions, one of which doesn't relate to the monument choice per se, so let me just get that one out of the way first. Um, before we put the sod in there, because I think we were all written by a gentleman in the community who was concerned, given the current drought conditions that we were planting, swaths of grass there. Um, had we considered alternatives and consciously made a decision that, no, this is, a, this is a reasonable place to put sod and the water use associated with it? We did. Um, we could have left it. We could have um, purchased synthetic turf. Um, but I thought this was a nice, quick, inexpensive fix to the park in order to have the ceremony and dedicate the park um, for the volunteer. So this was a low-cost option. And... Um, I believe after we get going with Farmer's Market and Art and Wine Fair, it will revert back to that um, condition that it just was. So we do need to take a look at a longer-term solution for this park, um, probably more of a hardscape than, than installing sod every 12, 12 months. Okay. <coughs> Thank you. The question I had specifically about the monument <coughs> options, excuse me, um, the first one, which, which I think of as the 
now standard San Carlos park sign. Um, the ones that I'm familiar with in driving around our community, frankly, in that particular park, strike me as they'll be way too large. Um, and I w do we have something that's more appropriate to the scale of that park, or is that really no? That's that's. We have smaller ones, and if you if you can recall the little island that we just installed in Old County Road going into Loreola, there's a, t a smaller version which would be more appropriate for the size of that park. You're right. I forgot about that one. Okay, so, so we can we can shrink it oh, basically. Sure. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, thank you. That that was my questions. Thank you, uh, Matt. I looked at the staff report and answered my own question. Okay. Thank you. Um, well, my question was if, if this really follows what, what Mark's question was is that the combination that you were thinking of that does involve a smaller sign. Yes, it does. Okay. Thank you. Um, again, we are accepting any public comment. If anybody would like to speak on this. All right. Mr. Mayor. Okay. Go for it. Appreciated <laughs> Mark again. I move to select option four as the monument for dedication of the Frank D. Harrington Park at 729 Laurel Street. Second. All right. We have a motion and a second. Uh, discussion, Bob. I just, uh, Christine, I just wanted to ask you, it, this was your preference? It, you don't yes. think it's going to be too busy or you're going to, because you've got the, you know, you've got the sculpture there too. Correct, yes. It's we, not going to be, you're going to somehow figure out a way to go like this and this and so the, it won't just be a, a line of things in front? Yes, we've had several field trips to the park and we've <laughs> scouted out each option. So you figure that you could put the sign back here and the, or, or maybe the, right. the monument back there and the sign up here? Some, okay, right. that was the only question I had. Because it, it could get real busy if you line them all up. Okay. okay. Uh, oh, your light was on, now it's off. Okay. All right, thank you, Christine. Thank you. Okay, uh, we have a motion and a second. And Crystal? Councilmember Grisilli? Yes. Councilmember Grocott? Yes. Councilmember Johnson? Yes. Councilmember Obert? Yes. Mayor Collins? Yes. Okay, and with that, I believe... We are adjourned. Thank you. <laughs>